Hey, Wire Monkeys. This week we're talking about signal to noise ratio and copper testing and why you should care. Welcome to the show where we tackle the tough questions submitted by installers, project managers, estimators, ICT personnel, even customers. We are connecting at the human level so that you can connect the world. If you're watching this show on YouTube and you like this content, would you hit the subscribe button and the bell button to be notified when new content is being produced? If you're listening to us on one of the audio podcast platforms like Apple or Google Play or Stitcher, Would you mind leaving us a five-star rating? Those simple little steps helps us take on the algorithm so we can educate, encourage, and enrich the lives of people in the ICT industry. Thursday night, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. What are you doing? I do a live stream on TikTok and Instagram and Facebook and a bunch of other places where you get to ask your favorite RCDD, that would be me, questions about installation, design, certification, estimation, even career path questions. And finally, while this show is free and will always remain free, if you would like to be a supporter of this show, would you mind clicking on that QR code right there? You can buy me a cup of coffee. You could even schedule a 15-minute one-on-one Zoom call with me, after hours, of course. Just help to support the show. So as I mentioned, copper testing. The copper tester does a lot of things. Let's be more specific. The certifier does a lot of things. And one of the tests that it does is called a signal-to-noise ratio. A lot of technicians don't understand what that is or how to do that. And I can explain it to you, but I figured it'd be much better if I brought on a subject matter expert. Of course, you know I had to bring in Steve Gals from AEM. Steve, how you doing, my friend? Good, Chuck. Good. It's always good to see you. I, I learn something every time I talk to you. Uh-oh, what'd you learn this time? Um, I learned that I'm drinking water because I was going to be recording on Chuck's show, so <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have my usual glass of wine. <laughs> now, there you go. Well, hey, might have been, might have made this subject matter a little more interesting if both yeah. of us would have had a glass of wine. Yeah. Well, I, I called you just, just, uh, just last week. Late last week, I had a technical question from your day job. So, yep, yeah. yep, yep. Yep. So, so see, we hang out in real life. It's not. It's not just one of those podcast things. So, yep. we, uh, we, 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 we talk even offline after a while. So, so you're the one well, for the couple of people who joined since you've been on last. Because you've been, it's been, I think, what four months, six months that you've been on. Maybe something like that. it might be. Yeah. 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 Why don't you just give us a quick intro? Who you are? Who you work for? And why sure. you are an expert in this? All right. Uh, my name is Steve Cowles. I am the product manager and technical services manager with AEM Precision Cable Test. We manufacture cable certification testers, which are really multifunction testers that, that do SNR testing. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, I've been in the ICT industry since 1986. So I've been around a long time. Uh, the last 24 years I've been involved in, uh, in the test equipment side of things. Very cool. So uh, we consider you a subject matter expert. So let's start off with what is SNR? Is it just another three-letter acronym, or is that something we really need to be paying attention to? It's both. It is uh, it is a three-letter acronym. stands for signal-to-noise ratio. And, and broken down just by those words, you're looking at the signal, you're looking at the noise, and it's a ratio. It's a comparison. You know, um, and, and when you're comparing signal, you want a higher signal than you do noise. So a higher ratio means a higher number. So when we're testing SNR, the higher the number, the better. And what it, what it really boils down to, what signal to noise ratio is, it's, it, it's a little more complicated than just injecting the signal and measuring the relative noise um, that's influencing the cable. There's a lot more going on there. It's, it's what we call uh, channel operating margin testing. So it takes into account the, perf- the cabling performance characteristics. It takes into account the transceiver, or the transmitter and receiver on, on both ends, and, and it kind of weighs all that in when it's looking to that, that signal level and looking at the noise level. And uh, IEEE 
sets out you know all the Ethernet standards. You know they, they lay out everything, all the requirements for Ethernet, and then of course the TIA and ANSI and ISO and everybody follows them for the performance standards for the cabling to support it. And IEEE, IEEE specifies um, 10 to the minus 12 for your error rate. So that, that's a bit error rate, which means in one trillion bits of information, you're allowed one error. That's it. Um, what, what, one trillion bits? One trillion. You're only allowed Holy one cow. error bit in one trillion. Uh, that how many gigabits are in a trillion? Do you know? Uh, it's a it it goes yeah it's a thousand million so or a thousand a thousand billion rather so one to uh, ten to the negative twelve so when you when you think about it that way you that when you're looking at an SNR test I mentioned zero it that's like the floor so and the default in our testers is going to show you zero. That is the IEEE minimum. It's not what I would recommend setting your tester to. Pretty much if you use 3 dB, you're good, especially at 10 gig. You want 3 dB of, of, of margin or headroom, we like to call it. Um, mm -hmm. If you get to zero, it means you've got that one error in one trillion. That's what the zero means. If you get below zero, you're, you've got problems because then the, uh, the transceivers can't overcome the errors with the, the auto correction and the, and the modulation. So, um, and, and you can get, you can get situations where you might, you, you might be able to get 10 gig running on a cat five E if it's the only cable, if there's nothing else around it, there's no other things transmitting. You might be able to do it. It's probably going to be for a shorter distance. You're probably not going to go all the way out to hundred meters with that, but you could probably run it. Now, when you start introducing other things, you start to see problems. So like if you've got legacy cable, this is where SNR testing really becomes handy. If you've got a legacy system, you've got some 5E and you're getting ready to upgrade your network speeds. You know, you were running one gig. Now you want to run two and a half or you want to run five. You could do certification testing just to make sure the cable's still good because time can have an impact on it. But an SNR test gives you an idea how it's going to perform when you've got network gear up and running. So um, that's that's where an SNR test is going to, to come in handy. It goes beyond what certification does. Um, yeah, it, it, it actually, you know, it's more of a real world scenario. I know I kind of went off on a tangent there, but you know, that's what I did. No, 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 no. I think, I think you did great. That's why, that's why I wanted you on here because you, you explained a lot better than I could. I, to me, I like boiling it down into, uh, parables if jesus taught in parables and it works so well for him it works for me too right so let me give you an example and let me know if i'm wrong with my with my example here so you you know this about me i have two dogs i have a german shepherd and a german shepherd cattle dog mix and speaking of which the cattle dog mix is right behind ah. me <clears throat> and he's got that typical cattle dog really high-pitched yelp you know that the cattle dogs have so when we go to let the dogs out, they both go running to the back door. My, my, my shepherd, she knows to sit down and just kind of wait. Him, he can't control himself. He, he starts doing a yip, 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 yip. Well, the other night, Barbie and I were talking as I was walking to the back door. He started, I couldn't hear Barbie because he was yippity, yippy yipping. So if I was the transmitter and he was the noise, his noise level was too high that Barbie, the receiver, couldn't get my transmission signal. Is that a good example of signal that, to noise ratio? That, that that is a good example. That's an example of crosstalk, um, which crosstalk affects signal to noise ratio. It comes back to you, you've heard of alien crosstalk. Um, so we all, you know, when we first started testing these cables with certifiers back in the '90s, we we you know crosstalk was was one of the big test parameters. And we we those of us who have been around for a while, we know what crosstalk is. The old phone guys crosstalk was, you know, a voice line. You'd hear somebody else's conversation because it was two adjacent pairs and it would bleed over. Mm -hmm. Same thing in the data world. So that's within the cable between the pairs. Now, when you get bundles of cables in an installation, now you've compounded that problem. You've got crosstalk not just within the cable that you have to, to mitigate, but you've got crosstalk between cables that you have to mitigate. And and as the cabling technology has advanced, the designs uh, of the physical structure of the cable have overcome a lot of this. 
uh, especially Cat 6A. I mean, if if money's no object, I would say you want to put Cat 6A in, no matter what you're doing. If you're doing copper twisted parrot, you want to put Cat 6A in, uh, and especially if you're running PoE. Um, but Cat 6A will help mitigate that alien crosstalk. It helps mitigate you know the the other noises that can get in. Other than the cable bundles, you've got other noises, other interferers that can get into the cabling. Um, and shielding's another way to mitigate that issue too. Um, you know, shielded cable will help with noise ingress and outgress. Is that a word? <laughs> the you know, the noise escaping the cable. Egress. Um, the opposite's egress. Ingress and egress. See, there you go. I learned. I taught, I taught you another new thing today. There you go. You taught me something. Outgress. Yeah. Boy, I feel stupid now. <laughs> but but yeah. So so the shield the shield keeps the noise in as well as keeps the noise out if the, if that makes right. any sense and so does the design like cat 6a the way it's designed it's designed to keep as much of the signal intact as possible um you know so so you know those those are some of the things that, that when we start looking at the cabling like i mentioned that 5e earlier that's a perfect case where yeah maybe it's time to pull that cable out if you need to run higher data rates 5e is not going to cut it if you you know if like i said if you got a short run it's just one run you might be okay but really you you need to consider upgrading the cable if it's not going to support it is uh is an snr test in the profile of test that the te- the c the the 100 tester does the or test is, pro- is that in the nsa it is, uh, it's in both actually um so every test pro you know the the, the um Every Test Pro handset has a one gig Ethernet port on the side of it, and you can do one gig SNR testing. Uh, so you can do one and 100 meg uh, out the side Ethernet port. If you get the 80 net cable adapter, which comes with our K60, K61, K71 series testers, uh, that also does multi gig Ethernet up to 10 gig SNR testing, and it does PoE testing, and you can do an auto test that will run all of that at once. So it'll do a 10, 10 gig, two and a half gig, five gig, um, and it'll do a connection speed test at one and 100 meg, and then it will do your PoE all at the same time. And you can check or uncheck whatever you want. You know, if you're doing all of those, it's a 43 second test. It's not as fast as a cat as a cat 6a test, which for us only takes six seconds. Um, but you get a lot of information in that that 43 seconds with an SNR test, and it certainly way faster than running a, a BERT test. So if you, you know, looking at doing the same thing, BERT and SNR are, they're targeting the same problem. So if you're having a cabling problem or you're trying to figure out if your cable is good enough to support a specific speed, you, you come back to that error rate that I talked about, you know, the one in a trillion. Both a BERT test and an SNR test are going after that same bit of information. They're trying to find out if I've got this errors. If you have SNR within the IEEE limits, you can support that 10 to the minus 12. And an SNR test at 43 seconds will give you that information. A BERT test, capturing one bit in a trillion isn't really enough. Um, you, you need to run that. Typically, a BERT test will run that test about 100 times. And when you do that, because the amount of time it takes, uh, it takes like 1.7 minutes to run a BERT just the single BERT to find that one in, in a trillion because that's how long it takes you to send a trillion bits of information. And we're talking at 10 gig. At the slower speeds, it takes even longer. So it takes you, if you're going to run 100 of those, it's going to be almost three hours to do a BERT test to determine, am I okay? Versus an mm-hmm. SNR test in 43 seconds. So, uh, and, and really, BERTs are really, they're, they're a great test, but they're really more geared for lab. Gotcha. So if someone has a SNR fail on a, on a cable tester, what's, what's the most likely cause of that? So a couple things can happen. Insertion loss is a big one. Uh, as you can imagine, insertion loss impacts how much signal that you've injected in that cable gets to the other end. Because if you've got too much insertion loss, that signal attenuates. It gets weaker and weaker as it goes along the cable. Every cable has insertion loss. There's a certain amount that we're allowed. If you have too much insertion loss, that signal degrades so much. And then by the time it gets to that far end, the signal's so weak that now the noise is stronger than the signal. And that's when you run into SNR problems. Um, insertion loss, the most common cause of insertion loss, 
excessive insertion loss is going to be length of the cable. You know, if your cable's too long, you're going to have bad insertion loss numbers. Um, <clears throat> now, there, there's other ways to overcome that. Um, you know, there are some heavier gauge cables that have less insertion loss. Uh, Cat 6A is a good example. It's typically a 23 gauge instead of a 24, uh, like we have with 5E or 6. So you're going to naturally, because the copper has less resistance, have less insertion loss. Um, that can impact you. And there are other things that can cause insertion loss. You can get some insertion loss from poor termination. I think we talked about that one before. Mm -hmm. um, yep. But, but anything that impacts crosstalk can impact your SNR values. If you've got a poor termination at both ends, you're not only getting bad crosstalk between the pairs on the cable that's going to fail a, a, a certification test for crosstalk, but now that bad termination can potentially allow noise to ingress into the cable, not egress, ingress, uh, into that cable. So, um, so there, there's, there's a lot of things that can impact this. Um, during your installation, if you're doing shielded cable and you don't do your bonding properly, that can cause problems. You can get external noise, not just crosstalk, alien crosstalk from other cables in a bundle. Uh, if you don't ground and bond properly, you can actually turn your cable into an antenna. Um, you know, and it's and, and and I think you've had this question in one of your um, more multiple you, times. I get this. Yeah. I get this question all the time. People are like. But Chuck, if you if you bond uh, if you if you if if you don't bond if you only bond one side, you'll get an you'll get an antenna. I'm like, <clears throat> if you go read the TDMM, anything above one megahertz, it recommends to bond both sides to a ground. So that's gonna yeah you know, that's gonna exclude your maybe like your fire alarm systems, you know your stuff that's operating at really low frequencies and stuff. But yeah, data cabling bond both ends to a ground. It just but it's but it's but it's tricky how you do that bond, right? Because at the equipment end, the bond is done with the shielded patch cord going to the jack. You don't bond the shield into the the ground right. lug in a in a, a, a an outlet box, because then you create the ground loop, and that's what that is what confuses a lot of people because they don't think about that shielded patch cord is what ties into the equipment. The equipment's grounded. That's where your bond happens, and and. That it, it comes up a lot, and then people go, well, what if I just use an unshielded patch cord? Like, no, no, you don't want to use an unshielded patch cord. Use a sh If you've got shielded cable, you're going to use a shielded patch cord. That's the, the purpose is to help with that bond. So. so, yeah, insertion loss, the first thing I would look at would be excessive length or or maybe too much slack loop, my slack loops, right? That would be the yeah, first place yeah. I would look for insertion loop, first insertion loss. The next place I would probably look is... The environment is it is it going through a really hot environment because that can cause insertion loss too because the heat and then and the resistance yeah exactly and then after that if, if if both of those are satisfied then i'd be looking at maybe moisture somewhere and if not moisture then maybe a mismatch of of components correct like a 5e on a six or maybe maybe the mismatch of components might be higher up on the list actually because that's more likely to happen than Moisture does happen, so does heat. So I think it would really be length, mismatch components, heat, and and then work my way down from there. Or a Monday morning cable manufacturing run, where you got you know you got some you got, you know you got some cable. Now there are a lot of great cable manufacturers out there. Um, I know you work for for one of the best in your day job, and and there are some manufacturers out there that. You know, uh, you know, you, you you get what you pay for, and yes, um, yes, you know, yes. like I think you did a comparison on one of your shows with cable from a big box store. Yeah, I bought I bought some cable from uh, from Lowe's. I went to Lowe's yeah. and bought um, uh, some of their cable, and I and I did a manufacturer cable and I compared the two together. But you know that 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 in itself wasn't. I think I should. I, I, now that I got my tester back. I need to do another show because at the time the cable that was being sold at Lowe's, it, it's still one of the major manufacturers. This is not one of the better known major manufacturers, right? So, 
there's a lot of people who buy cable from like Amazon that have like some brand name that nobody's ever heard of. That's what you need to test. That's that, what I need to compare. Yeah. Because there's a lot of people who will go to Amazon and buy a thousand feet of whatever, whatever. And I'm not going to do it with copper clad aluminum cabling. I, that's one of the, I'm, I'm just, I'll find me a good, I'll find me a copper cat five E cat six, whatever off of Amazon and buy some and then compare that to one of the big three, one of the big four. There, and then we'll see. And it's interesting. You mentioned the copper clad aluminum because that, that can cause you pro- all kinds of problems, not just insertion loss problems. Yes. Um, if you're running POE and you put that stuff in for POE, you're going to have problems. Because they have a really hard time getting a good DC resistance on balance in that. So that, you know, the pairs need to be within a certain tolerance of, of having the same resistance level. And copper clad aluminum, it, it's a big problem out there. It causes all kinds of issues for, for, for cabling. Yeah, A, it could be a code violation. B, aluminum is more brittle, so it breaks easier. And so there's a lot of problems that come along with CCA cabling. If you and I matter of fact, I did a I don't remember if I did an episode on CCA cable or if I did a live stream on CCA cable, but I did talk about it. And there's a lot of issues that go along with that. I mean, a lot of issues. Yeah. So okay, so attenuation is one. I guess um, what other things could cause signal to noise ratio loss uh, failures? So I think I mentioned everything that contributes to crosstalk. So bad termination. Uh, mismatch of jacks, which can increase the return loss. Anything that degrades the performance characteristics of the cabling can impact that. Um, where the cabling is is run, not just for heat that you mentioned, but um, you know we all know when we tested for RCDD, this was like drilled in your head. You know, distance from electrical and crossing at ninety degrees, and and and. But you know, Chuck, we see violations of that practice all the time in the field. Yes. Um, I've seen people testing cable with the cable tester laying on a transformer box. (laughs) 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 This isn't even the installation part of it, but the tester is sitting on an electrical transformer because it was there. It, it, It was convenient to place the tester there, not realizing the impact that, 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 um, that electromagnetic right. interference plays because if you're right. near an EMI source, not only can you have problems if you've got your tester sitting on a transform, but you've, if you've got excessive EMI where your cables are running, um, you know, maybe you've got a long run of, of, of um, cat five E or cat six, even six a, and you've got a parallel run of electrical that runs for an extended distance along it. You're going to have problems. You know, you're, you're going right. to induce that noise into the cable. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned the separation from electrical because that's that's one of the th- you want to start an argument on the internet for low voltage guys. That's one of them right there, is separation from EMI, because y- you mentioned it. The, the 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 standards in the TMM tell us we have to stay 12 inches away from all electrical. If we have to cross electrical, cross it at a 90. That's what it tells us. <clears throat> in real life, it's not so black and white. It's shades of gray. You know, it really depends on. What kind of a network you're running across at? Is it an analog phone line or is it a 10 gig network? <clears throat> that electrical cable, is it a 20 amp circuit with nothing plugged into it? Or is it a 20 amp circuit with 90 things plugged into it? I mean, there's a lot of variables. So the 12 inches and 90 and, and cross it at 90 is to protect. So the, the installers on the field don't have to think about those issues. Because if they follow that rule, they will be good for 95% of the installs they come across. So, yeah, if you, if you, have, if you, if you have a cable sitting at 11.75 inches from an electrical source, it probably will still work. You know, there's just, just too many variables. But if you follow that rule, you're going you're gonna to save yourself from getting lots of headaches down, down the path. That's, that's the best thing. That's the best way I can explain for EMI because I get that question quite yeah. often quite often well and and sometimes the emi might come from something that wasn't there during the install it came after the fact equipment that was installed and somebody felt like this big giant copier was best placed right next to the the data rack you know so so now you've got this thing has has a big motor in it and and that motor generates an emi field 
right next to your right. data rack. Um, yeah, it, some of those kind of things are beyond the control of the low voltage installers because they came after the fact. It's you know, it's things happen. They they you know put things in. You know, put a big sub zero freezer with a big compressor on it. You know, right next to the, where the cabling runs through the tray, you're getting right. EMI. But that's why we test and why we want headroom, because we don't right. know what's going to come after the fact. We we test, we certify. You want margin between the pass fail limit line and where your cable actually performs, and that's why you do your job well. That's why you follow correct termination practices. That's why you cross at a ninety. Why you try to maintain that twelve inch distance so that you've got as much buffer between that that where it could possibly fail and where you're actually performing as possible because you know something's going to happen down the road something's going to change somebody's going to do something to your cable somebody's going to <clears throat> install something right next to your cable anything could happen yeah average lifespan for a structural structure cable plant is seven to ten years that's why i tell people all the time don't don't install it for today install mm -hmm. it for tomorrow because yeah, you know, and I could come up with numerous examples off the top of my head where people say, "Well, Cat Five is fine." Okay, today, you know, or I can mount that I can mount that uh, hinged wall bracket to the wall with with drywall anchors because all I'm putting on is just a hinged wall bracket. Today, right? You know, what what, what if they put PoE on that stuff in the future? What if they mount a voicemail unit on that plywood? Now it's not you know, install for tomorrow. That's just, right. Yeah. So once once you break it down to its your components. Well, if it's now if it's if the signal to noise loss ratio is from attenuation, again, go look at your cable length, look at your you know if it's in hot area mismatch components. If it's crosstalk, you know your avenues there would be go to a shielded solution, make sure your separations are good. Um, does the signal does, does the SNR test tell you the source is really a RFI EMI issue or an attenuation issue, or, do you, or is, how would you know well, which is which? No, it, it really just um, it tell, it gives you that ratio, the signal to the noise. It doesn't break it down as to what type of noise it is. Um, but the SNR test does tell you by pair what your SNR value is. You can then compare that with your cable test results, your certification test results. And go, okay, 3, 6, 4, and 5. We know those are always the worst combinations, right? That's mm -hmm. my worst performing pair. Let me go look at it. Look at my my certification test and and our tester. I, I think pretty much every tester has this. I saw one manufacturer a couple of weeks ago saying, "Oh, we're the only ones that do this." Well, I think we all do it. Uh, where you have a TDR test um, as part of your you know to find the crosstalk or to find the return loss. There's a TDR trace in there, and when you look and say, "Okay, a yeah, three and six is bad." Let's look at my TDR trace for crosstalk and pinpoint where it is. Typically, that's going to be one end or the other. But in some cases, it could be a spike. Um, maybe, and this is why I'm an advocate of retesting cable periodically. Maybe your cable passed with flying colors when you installed it. But now you're six months down the road, you're having problems. You go in, yep, SNR looks horrible. Let's run another certification test on that link. Now we see a crosstalk spike halfway through yeah. the cable. And what's happened is some other trade has come in. They say, oh, this cable trade looks convenient. I'm going to pull my whatever cable through here, and I'm going to use zip ties and zip it to this bundle. And now they've crushed one of your cables, and that's the culprit. And you can see that on that, that crosstalk TDR. And you know we're not the only ones that have that. It's a great test. Now, it doesn't, our, with our tester, I'm not sure about the others. With ours, it doesn't add any time to the test. It's just part of the results. Um, but, but I'm pretty sure most manufacturers have that TDR functionality built in for crosstalk and return loss. We also add it for shield. So if you've installed shielded cabling, and that might be a, uh, an issue, I've seen cases where a rodent chewed through the outer sheath and, and damaged the shield of the cable but didn't sever the conductors. And with a shield... TDR locator, you can pinpoint anomalies where maybe the shield's not totally compromised and a regular wire map test, it looks good. You got that, that black line from S to S on your wire map, but that's not the whole story. So with the shield locator, right. you see that TDR trace, you'll see a spike where that, that shield has been compromised, but not totally severed. Excellent. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> so let's, let's shift the conversation now. <clears throat> 
um, your podcast. It's changing a little bit. It is. Tell us a little bit about some of your new changes with your with your podcast yeah. or your so, Tech Talk with Steve. Yep. So Tech Talk with Steve, um, uh, we are going to a global footprint. We were doing uh, a Tech Talk every other week, and it was just you know noon Eastern U.S. time. We've gotten a lot of followers in other parts of the world, uh, Middle East and Europe and, and Asia Pacific. And what we decided to do is go to once a month, but it's going to be three shows, one in each regional time segment, if you will. So I'll be doing it at like 11 o'clock on Tuesday nights um, for the Asia Pacific team. I'll be doing it on Thursday mornings at 7 a.m. for the Europe and Middle East. And then the U.S. will be Thursdays at uh, 3 p.m. And it'll be one Thursday every month. The schedule's out on our website uh, if you go out there, go to aem-test.com, click the little, I like to call it a hamburger, but it's only two lines, so you can't really call it a hamburger, but it's the upper right-hand corner, you know what I'm talking about, and you'll, mm-hmm. you'll see you know, a list of things that you can link to on the website, one of those is Tech Talk with Steve, you go there, it'll show you by region, you pick which region you want, and it'll it'll show you the schedule in there, so um, so we, uh, we'll, we'll be doing those, it'll essentially be the same show each of the three, um, especially this first one uh, that I'm, I'm getting ready to do. Um, it, it's all going to be the same for each of the three shows, but because we're going global, we may have different guests on in different regions, um, You know, people that are well-known regionally rather than just well-known here uh, in the U.S., right. you know, other subject matter experts. We'll also have some of my coworkers, um, you know, Jim Florio here in the U.S. may host, Werner, um, uh, here in, uh, over in Dubai or, or Al Sutherland in the UK may host or Dixon Tan over in Singapore. So we could have other people hosting. We may even get, uh, uh our, uh, general manager, Harshang, uh, on a couple of these shows and, and Arvind, our director nice. of engineering. So I've had Arvind on in the past. We did a, a Burt versus SNR, um, comparison and, uh, he, he helped me understand the difference between the two, um, uh, quite a bit. So. And those will still all be recorded, right? So if I want to watch... Yep, and all the old episodes are still there. Uh, all the new ones will be recorded, so you can watch as many as you want, as often as you want. Nice. Okay, now let's talk about the, the changes to the, uh, to, the, to the 100. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so late last year, I want to say it was November-ish, <coughs> we announced our E-Series platform. So it's the same, same physical tester. Uh, looks exactly the same. Yeah, everything's the same. But this one, you can see the screen is a little, it's a little shinier, if that makes any sense. A lot, yes. it's a little more glassier. So the old style, um, what we call the legacy, had a resistive touch display, um, and resistive touch displays have a whole different feel to them. The capacitive display is more like your cell phone, much more responsive to the fingertip. Um, the old version, we would have a hard stylus that clipped into the back that you could use because when you're typing on a keyboard for resistive, it's much easier to do that than to try and use your finger. The new capacitive display, you could use a soft stylus, but I've found just using my finger works, works great. Display is much brighter. Um, the new E series, uh, also now ships with cat 8.1 permanent link adapters. So, um, uh, you get the CAT 8.1 channel, CAT 8.1 permanent links. You can do CAT 8.1 and below. Of course, if you need to do CAT 8.2, you're talking GG45 or Terra connectors. Uh, we've got permanent link and channel adapters for those as well. Um, um, those are the big changes to the unit. Uh, functionally, it's identical. It uses the same firmware. It's the same tester. Um, you know, it's not a case where, oh, we're abandoning that old platform. That old platform is the same. It's It's the same. They're both the same platform. It's the same exact tester. It's just a difference in that display. In the new E-Series, we've, we've added some enhancements like the permanent link. When we get to the fiber testers, um, we now include the fiber inspection scope in the, in the E-Series. We also include the adapter kit to do SCs. We always came with the ability to test LCs, but now we've included the, the uh, SCs. Um, and then beyond that, we also... Uh, added OTDR this year. So uh, I think that was May we launched OTDR. And the OTDR adapter can plug into your test pro. So you can use it for troubleshooting or when you combine it with an optical loss test with our our fiber uh, loss test system, 
you now have tier two testing capability if you need it. The OTDR adapter also works in the NSA, our Qualification Plus tester. It's the only qualifier on the market that you can plug an OTDR adapter into. So, um, and of course, the NSA was really designed for people doing move that changes, network troubleshooting, mm -hmm. network managers, network techs, those kind of people. So having an OTDR, uh, in addition to being able to do a loopback fiber test with that, you know, it really just it adds a lot more functionality to the NSA as well. You guys always have good stuff going on over there at AEM. Always do. And I'm glad I got my tester back because, like I said, I'm working on the show where I'm going to do the, you know, I'm going to do the whole, e, I'm going to do the test with running next to electrical cable. I'm going to do the, the half, half inch untwist, you know, versus one inch untwist versus, you know, all that stuff. So I just, been, now that my, my tester's calibrated and ready to rock and roll. So. Did you, uh, have you played with the new capacitor displays I put on there for you? No, not yet. Not yet. I hadn't had a chance to play with it yet. You have to let me know what you think of those because I know you, you've used the resistive, so it'd be interesting to see your feedback on, on what you think of the new yep. capacitive. I'll, de I'll definitely shoot you a message. Steve, thanks for coming on again today and helping us solve the, the SNR debate and, and the issues that goes on with that, and, and maybe hopefully some people learn some more from it. All right. Sounds good. Thanks for having me on, Chuck. Always good to see you. So hopefully you were able to learn something new this week. Evidently, I taught Steve two new things this week. Signal-noise ratio, it is an issue, but now you should know how to res resolve it. Till next time, knowledge is power. That's it for this episode of today's podcast. We hope you were able to learn something. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on future content. Also, leave a rating so we can help even more people learn about telecommunications. Until next time, be safe.